Okay, I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Lori Baker. Lori currently serves as the statewide Housing and Employment First Coordinator in the Office of the Secretary of the Illinois Department of Human Services, so DHS. In her role as statewide housing coordinator, she's responsible for the implementation of two Section 811 project-based rental assistance program awards, partners with community service agencies throughout Illinois to support access to affordable housing for persons with disabilities and older adults, and partners with various state agencies to facilitate a comprehensive approach to increasing housing stock and pathways into community housing, which is what we all want, community housing. In her role as Employment First Coordinator, Lori is responsible for the DHS Employment First Initiative, and she works across the IDHS divisions to create Employment First philosophy and framework. We truly appreciate her making the trip up today from Springfield. Please help me welcome Lori Baker. Thank you very much. How close do you have to stand to this to hear me? Can you hear me? All right. I'm gonna try, uh, try to talk slow because I'm a fast talker, but if I get to rambling um, too quickly, raise your hand and I will uh, slow down. Um, I have um, a, a kind of simplified version of the housing world that I'm gonna talk about today because it's a very complicated system, just like many of the systems that you're seeking to get um, services from. Um, so uh, I wanna make sure that you have the basic understanding you have a copy of my PowerPoint in your um, packet, so you can take notes on that. Also at the back of that um, PowerPoint um, is information about how to contact me. So if questions come up afterwards or um, you think of something that you wanna know about or you have some uh, question or wanna have a discussion about your particular situation, please feel free to contact me via email or by phone. And I really appreciate um, all of you being here on uh, what is like one of the first first beautiful Saturdays um, when we all should be out picking up the sticks and mowing our yard. Um, so I appreciate you giving up your time to come here. I'm going to start out with um, a really basic um, question for people. Do, have people here ever heard of the term supportive housing? Anybody? Yeah, good. We've got um, some people in the audience, but just for those of you who don't know, supportive housing at its very minimum is affordable housing in the community that you have a lease in your own name, you have rights of tenancy, um, you have uh, tenant responsibilities, you lease from a landlord that's affordable to you, usually with a rental subsidy or some kind of funding that has made the property affordable for people with um, low income, coupled with the supportive services um, that you want and need in order to live integrated in the community. And it's very simplest. There's all kinds of fancy things about, you know, whether it's scatter site or single site or all these different other, is it, you know, master leased, is it this or that? But at its core, supportive housing is affordable housing plus the services and supports that you need as a person with a disability to live your best life in the community of your choice. Um, so this has been um, a housing option for years and years and years in the, um, in several of our different systems and has not, um, really been um, uh, offered to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities because our system has been overly reliant on community integrated living arrangements or kind of shared housing um, and, um, and institutionalization, unfortunately. So um, as I came to the state of Illinois um, three years ago from the Supportive Housing Providers Association, I um, began to um, be really lucky to be engaged with the uh, intellectual and developmental disability service system world and advocacy world and began to work on how we could make sure that this was an option and an opportunity for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There are lots of different types of affordable housing, right, that could be the affordable part of the supportive housing. One of those options are your local public housing authorities, or PHAs as people call them for short. There are more than 100 around the state of Illinois. Um, in the Chicagoland area, there's probably about 20, depending upon what county and what um, city you live within within the county. Those um, housing authorities have usually have a couple of different kinds of um, affordable um, housing options. They have what are called public housing units, which are buildings that the 
Public Housing Authority has gotten money from the federal government to um, create, um, that they've gotten to build and um, that are affordable because of getting the money from Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development for people with lower incomes. And um, uh, you know, they're kind of scattered around. They're usually integrated within communities. Um, sometimes um, there are uh, buildings that are for persons that are of a certain age and, and or have a disability, or there are um, buildings that are for just people that um, have the need for an affordable um, housing unit. The other kind of resource that some public housing authorities have is called um, Housing Choice Voucher. Many people might know of it as a Section 8 voucher um, that is a rental subsidy um, that um, people um, can um, be awarded a Housing Choice Voucher from the Housing Authority that they can then use to go to any rental property within their jurisdiction of the Housing Authority and rent a unit that is the size that they need and in the location that they want. And the person would pay 30% of their adjusted gross income towards the rent, and the housing choice voucher would pay the difference um, up to fair market rent on behalf of the person straight to the landlord. Um, the problem with um, any affordable housing resource is that there is much more demand than there is supply for um, affordable housing resources in general. And spe specifically, public housing authorities often have um, a very long waiting list or they ha don't even have an open waiting list that you can apply for. So it can um, be kind of complicated, but part of the um, the part of the, like, what do I need to do if I'm considering um, housing in the community? Part of what I have to do is get on every waiting list that I can possibly get on as a potential tenant um, that I, in the community areas where I'm interested in living, because it's kind of like the lottery. It's the affordable housing lottery. If you don't play, you don't win, and you got to play a lot um, in order to uh, enhance your chances to win that affordable housing lottery and get access to affordability. Um, I, um, uh, there is a HUD resource locator, the, Department, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. You can go into your app store, um, either Apple or Android um, has it for free. Um, you can download it onto your phone or your tablet um, in order to look at affordable housing resources um, in your community area. It uses your GPS. Um, you know, in your phone if you allow it to um, and you download the app in order to show you options that are in your community. Because one of the other complicating factors um, with um, affordable housing is that a lot of properties run their own individual waiting lists. So not only could you get on a public housing authority's waiting list, but you could get on individual property that are affordable housing waiting lists. Um, so that um, HUD locator is the first time that they've ever come out with this type of app from the federal government. Um, it's their first attempt at trying to help us find um, resources that um, are around us that we might not know about, right? That we might not have seen an ad in a paper or we might not know where those, those properties are at. So go down um, and download that app. If you don't want to download it, you can use it on your desktop computer by just simply um, searching for a HUD resource locator. You'll just have to select the state and then the community areas that you're interested in seeing the results from because it won't be able to use a GPS, right? So that um, is a kind of new um, available resource, newish. It's been around for probably about 10 months now, but I just try to encourage people to use it because there's never been the option before and it's been a lot more complicated to try to find um, what affordable housing resources HUD has out there um, because you know they have properties um, to get into the weeds and, and to go back to uh, Mr. Roskam's um, uh, analogy of putting your head in a bucket, um, there, there are uh, single properties that have affordability that don't show up through a public housing authority. And so this is your chance to look at a lot of those options that HUD helps pay for. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I help manage um, is what's called the Statewide Referral Network, or SRN. Um, this is a program of affordable housing, um, supportive housing options that is um, financed through the State Housing Finance Agency, which in Illinois is called the Illinois Housing Development Authority, or we call it IDA for short, IHDA. 
Whenever I first started working in uh, the housing arena, people kept talking about Ida, and I kept thinking, I really need to meet this person. She is so <laughs> smart and so involved in all of these things about housing. And then I, you know, go home and Google, you know, Ida, and I realize, oh, Ida is the anacronym for <laughs> the Illinois Housing Development Authority. So there are no um, dumb premise, right? There's no. Uh, a uh, silly question to ask because there's lots of jargon and all kinds of, um, you know, uh, an acronyms and everything that goes with all of this accessing whatever type of service that you're seeking um, for uh, you or your loved ones. So, um, you know, never be afraid to ask those questions. But the Illinois Housing Development Authority um, gets what are called low-income housing tax credits. It's actually an IRS program that is the largest um, creator of affordable housing across the nation. And that low-income housing tax credits are awarded to the Illinois um, Housing Development Authority who puts together a process for affordable housing developers to apply for those tax credits. And then what they do if they're awarded those tax credits, they sell those and use the money to create the property that they have been approved to receive the tax credits for. So that's a really simplified version of what LIHTC is. So Ida, a few years back in about 2007, uh, 2008, they wanted to increase the supportive housing resources that were available across the state of Illinois. And so they began to, within that application process for these low-income housing tax credit units, they began to incentivize or give a um, extra points within it for people who would agree to set aside 10 to 20 percent of the entire project um, units as statewide referral network units or supportive housing options. Um, the, since that time, um, we have um, uh, developed about 1,400 units around the state of Illinois that are statewide referral network units. I'm going to talk in a second about how people access um, the waiting list for those units. But the um, other, um, uh, another uh, web-based kind of resource that we have in the state of Illinois is our um, state of Illinois housing location. Locator. That's this www.ilhousingsearch.org. And um, that's a public um, website that anybody can go in and search for housing opportunities in specific areas. You can filter um, what's on that waiting list. If you're a landlord, you can put available properties that you have on that waiting list for free. Um, but embedded within that is information um, that um, uh, about our statewide referral network units and um, a waiting list in order to uh, gain access to those statewide referral network units. So what happens is um, we um, uh, attempt to um, connect through our waiting list people to the units that need the supportive housing affordable unit um, with um, uh, the person who has the services and supports that they want um, in order to live in their community. So um, the, uh, it's service providers. It's, a, it's not a self-referral um, kind of waiting list. And what we encourage um, uh, in terms of people um, who are um, could put your um, loved one or yourself on the waiting list is your individual service coordination entity because they're the folks that you're sitting and planning what you want your future to look like, what services you're interested in. And so they should be the folks that are able to connect you um, or your loved one onto our statewide referral network waiting list. Now, I will say that um, there are um, ISC agencies that are better at this, and there are ones that um, are not um, as quick to adopt the process. So if you have any challenges when you go to your ISC agency um, in them um, not knowing what you're talking about or um, having any questions, you can refer them to me. You have my contact information, and um, we will uh, make sure that they understand. I've done multiple trainings to ISC organizations, but again, um, some are quicker to adopt some things than others, um, so it just depends upon where you go for your ISC services. Um, the folks that are eligible for the statewide referral network are a head of household with a disability or experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. And you have to be at 30% of area median income or below. So low income is what um, is also required to have access to these statewide referral network units. Like I said, we have about 1,400 units, but we have new units coming online 
every day. Um, we have, we're right now in the beginning of prime building season, so spring, summer, fall, we'll have another about 200 plus units come online. And then we have turnover units every month, usually between 30 and 50 every month um, in order to um, match, you know, people have moved out and so they're looking for another um, referral source to that, um, to that property. Um, the way that this is done within our waiting list is based on um, where the uh, potential tenant um, states that they want to live. So, you know, when your ISC agent is putting information into the waiting list about um, your potential tenant, they're going to um, ask some basic questions about um, what county you want to live in or counties, what cities within those counties you're interested in. And um, I know we're, you know, kind of out in the suburbs, but if somebody selects Chicago um, is where they're interested in living, we also want to know what of the 77 community areas within Chicago um, you're interested in living in, because we want to offer you um, opportunities where you want to live. Um, when we make those um, matches, we take information about the unit that is available and run it against the waiting list. So we're going to run it. Um, uh, based on the uh, features of the unit. So if the unit's in um, Highland Park um, and um, it's a two bedroom and it has accessibility features, we're going to um, filter off to the side anybody who doesn't want to live in a two bedroom with accessibility features in Highland Park and come up with our waiting list for that particular unit. And then offer those people on the waiting list the opportunity to decide whether they want to be referred to the property or not. Um, that is totally, we want, you know, I mean, this is personal choice. This is um, where you want to go. So you might want to live in Highland Park, but you might want to not want to live on the street where this address of this um, property is. So you can always say no. Um, when you get offered the opportunity to refer. It doesn't change anything about your application that's on the waiting list. Um, it doesn't knock you to the bottom. It doesn't make you uh, reapply. It doesn't do anything like that because we want people to live where they want to live, right? Um, so um, we um, would just simply keep you on the waiting list. If people are interested in being referred, we um, send uh, their referral to the property with the name and phone number of the potential tenant that is eligible for the unit so that they reach out and have the um, person come in and complete the application process at the site of the um, property. Um, this has um, been um, going on, like I said, since 2007. We've had our online waiting list now for almost two years. It kicked off on June 1st of 2015. And we continue to create um, enhancements within that system to ensure that we're matching people to exactly where we want to go. The, the latest thing that we're working on adding is even deeper dive into the accessibility features that people need um, so that we make sure, because um, sometimes People select sometimes that they need a physically accessible unit um, when what they mean is they can't um, walk up and down four flights of stairs every time they go in and out of their apartment, but they may not be a chair user or have the need for a roll-in shower or cutouts or some of the other features that um, are you know, truly physical accessibility. So we're trying to refine those because those units are hard to find. Um, you know, units with um, uh, you know, auditory or visual or physical accessibility features um, are hard to find, especially affordable ones. So we want to make sure that we're matching people to the resources that they need and not um, putting people in units that um, really um, have more features than what they need um, and thereby leaving somebody else out of the opportunity to live there. One of the things that um, we are able to do um, because um, of a second program that we help manage through our waiting list, um, it's called Section 811 Project-Based Rental Subsidies. Um, that's a program that um, the Illinois Housing Development Authority, the Illinois Department of Human Services, the Department on Aging, and the Department of Healthcare and Family Services went together and applied to the Department of Housing and Urban Development for some money in order to make affordable for um, a, a disabled population um, rental subsidies um, that are placed on specific um, units throughout the state. And this was um, an effort by the federal government in order to open up or create more opportunities for what um, uh, a lot of folks would call the Olmstead population. So um, 1999, the federal Supreme Court did the Olmstead ruling that said that um, people with disabilities had the right to live in the least restrictive setting possible, um, even if the state was paying for the services that helped that person um, 
um, to lead the successful life that they wanted to lead. So. Um, uh, uh, this this kicked off in 1999. Um, most states didn't do a lot about it proactively, including Illinois, um, not surprisingly. Um, and um, a few years back, um, we were uh, uh, charged in three Olmstead-related class action lawsuits. And the one that um, you guys probably know the most about is a Ligas class action lawsuit for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and so, these resources are um, to help us in Illinois move people from institutional settings into the community. And the Ligas class is the only class um, that is eligible for these um, rental subsidies as puns list class members, right? Um, rather than having to um, be specifically institutionalized in an intermediate care facility for the developmentally disabled. So, you know, under Ligas, there's two um, sub um, uh, classes, subgroups. Um, those are folks that live in ICFDDs or folks that are on the puns list waiting to be selected for service. So, um, the you guys, the Ligas class members, are the only people that um, are in the community at large that are eligible for Section 11 resources at this point. Um, when I came to the state three years ago, it was pretty clear that we weren't going to be able to actually assist anybody in accessing these 811 resources that was involved in the intellectual and developmental disability service world because we didn't have a service package that was um, set up in order to um, actually access these units and get the support we needed in it. Because we had basically the 24-hour um, um, service package of SILA, 24-hour SILA services, and we have home-based services. And so the problem is, which traditionally home-based are some usually around 15 hours a week of service that you're getting, kind of depends upon what you choose to pay, right, the people that you hired. But, um, you know, the, the problem was between like 168 hours a week, which is 24 hours times seven, Maybe, close to it, if I didn't multiply right. And the, um, the uh, 15 hours. So we all know there's a lot of room in the middle, right, for different levels of service that I might need in order to access and, and live my best life integrated in my community of choice, right? So we began working with the Division of Developmental Disabilities to make this uh, a true option for people. Um, the Division has come out now with four different pieces of what they call um, communication bulletins or informational bulletins. They're not super easy to find uh, on the DHS website, but if you look up um, uh, informational bulletins um, that you should be able to find them, but um, you have a list of what these specific ones are. The first one is really important because it clarified um, there's, a, there's a little used or not very often used um, uh, definition of uh, intermittent scylla which is less intensive service than a 24-hour SILA. And there was a misunderstanding in the community that the cap on hours for intermittent SILA was 15 hours a week. And so the first thing that the division did was put out this clarification bulletin saying that was not the maximum amount of hours within an uh, intermittent SILA setting, but it was the minimum amount of hours in the SILA setting, and that what hours people were awarded within intermittent minute SILA for support should be based on what the person's personal um, need is, right? What their person-centered plan calls for and what their need for support is. So that was the first very important thing um, that, that happened in June of 2015. Then um, we got, uh, in April of 2016, we got some clarification on um, SILA family or person's own home. So one of the things about regular SILA is that the consumer, the tenant, gives up um, and doesn't get their Social Security disability payment to themselves. It goes to the provider in order for them to provide the SILA-based um, home residential type things that can't be paid for by Medicaid because Medicaid doesn't pay rent. 
Um, so um, they would have to give up their income and it would go to um, the property and then they get back like $50 a month in order to meet their personal um, care needs and, and what they want to do with that money. Well, that's a problem if I'm trying to access a rental subsidy because that means I can't because I don't have any income and my income goes to pay my rent technically um, to the SILA provider. So this piece of clarification was really important um, to talk about um, how we could have a SILA setting that would be person controlled, a person's own home SILA, my own apartment, um, that um, I would then have my um, uh, Social Security come directly to me. Um, I would be able to receive financial um, and budgeting services within my um, services package, uh, and I would be able to access the affordability of a rental subsidy or other affordable housing option. So that was the second really important thing. The third um, piece of uh, uh, inf um, clarification came out as a draft um, and is had so many comments um, from uh, the community at large that they've been working on assimilating those um, comments into a final version. But we have had people still be able to use this um, and receive the services in the way that this is mentioned. So this is really kind of super complicated, and um, but there, there's, there were some complicated ways that if you got more than 15 hours of service per week that you had to bill for those hours. And it was really complicated for everyone. It was complicated for the provider and for the uh, um, tenant and for the family and so this just clarified that we are going to design a rate a service rate based on the number of hours that a person needs and is approved for and so that's really important um, because it just makes um, makes it more possible for providers to say yes I will do this type of service the um, Fourth and final piece of um, uh, informational bulletins that came out um, just recently in July of 2016 it was the increase in behavioral intervention and treatment hours. And so those treatment hours um, have been increased from the opportunity to get 66 hours a year to 104 hours a year. And so that just, again, helps um, uh, if a person uh, needs some assistance in, in settling into the community and living on their own, um, th these are some additional hours that might be able to help um, with that process underneath behavioral intervention and treatment um, options. So <clears throat> in, uh, I can't um, show it to you because we didn't uh, work this out ahead of time, but if you um, look up or Google on YouTube a choice to succeed, which is on this um, slide here, um, there's uh, a video that is from a group of Ligus class members who are in the Edwardsville area. They're um, uh, in the Metro East area. They um, began working, they were select, most of them, not all of them, so there uh, was a family group that uh, met together. Their children had grown up together in um, the school system and in participating in, um, in uh, the community. Um, their children were um, adults, 20 to 30 years old, some 20 to 35, basically, um, had lived a very much more inclusive life than many, many people who of an older generation with disabilities had had been allowed to live. And when they were selected from the puns list, they didn't want any of the services that were available. They didn't want to, <coughs> excuse me, they didn't want to give up their freedom um, and their choices in the life that they had designed for themselves um, during the daytime to go into a 24-hour SILA where you have um, much less choice uh, at this particular moment um, on what you do with your day and how you're doing. Now we're changing, we're moving into um, lots of um, uh, changes within the, the DD system that is gonna help with that. Um, but at, you know, at the time, they were selected, most of them in the first puns pool that happened. Um, so they didn't wanna choose those. Um, they didn't wanna choose home-based service because I'm an aging parent of a 20 to 35 year old, I'm not gonna be here forever for my child to stay with me. What's home base is nice and it's great, you know, and it's flexible and I can, you know, choose the type of services that I want and pay what I want, but it, it oftentimes is not enough hours to support um, a person um, on their own um, in their own individual apartment or sharing with a roommate. So that, um, 
uh, you know, some people it is, and some people it's just not. And so they didn't want to choose either one of those. So they began meeting with all of the service providers in the community area where they lived. I mean, all of them. I mean, like they had people from everywhere <laughs> come in and talk to them. And this began like four years ago um, when they were selected. Um, so they had meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings. And, you know, everybody was like, no, we, we can't do that. It doesn't work. It won't work in our funding. We can't do, you know, anything different. Um, and there um, was one service provider that kind of stuck um, with them and kept saying, we're, we're willing to explore. We can think about what we're doing. Um, right about the time that they had been meeting for about a year or having these conversations for about a year, um, I um, was able to connect with with them and um, really quickly figured out as they raked me over the coals um, about what they wanted and what the state had promised them uh, many times, right? We often promise things and um, are not great at making sure that they really happen. Um, that there was a property in their um, community that was under construction that would just be perfect. It was by a running trail. It was on the transportation line. It was um, right next to shopping. It was, you know, kind of in downtown. It was just the perfect spot, and it was under construction now. They knew that. They drove by it every day. Um, so, um, they, you know, they're like, if we could have access to something like that, this would be totally, totally work. And as I drove home from that initial meeting with them, I realized, well, I kind of realized whenever they said it, that this was a property that was Illinois Housing Development Authority funded property and that we might have access to be able to um, make sure that people would get access to those units through the statewide referral network because there were SRN units in that property. So we began um, working with the division to come to what, what could be the service package that, that folks could um, access. And that's where these informational bulletins came from. So over a period of uh, probably another year and a half um, with lots of uh, frustration um, and many times that um, you know you thought the whole thing was dead. Um, we uh, were actually able to finally come to it and last um, spring um, the uh, group of six people um, from uh, this um, group moved into a building uh, that had affordable units for them. We have um, five units. Uh, one couple shares a two-bedroom uh, unit and um, then um, uh, four people have their own individual units units scattered throughout uh, a, a property um, that is very nice. Um, and in this video, there's um, information about the consumers and their parents and them talking about what it means to them and, and, and how the Public Housing Authority, who was a partner and was the uh, people that helped build this property, um, and all the pieces that went into that. So it's kind of a fun, it's about five minute video, um, and it's nice to see what the possibility is. So far we've had about um, 19 people that are Ligus class members. 19 people that are Ligus class members that um, have access statewide referral network or Section 11 units across the state. Um, uh, that's not a huge number, but it continues to increase, and it all depends upon you know what you're asking for and what you're looking for. Um, so. Um, as, as you think about um, what it is that um, uh, your, your loved one wants to do with their life and how they want to live their, their life as they are getting ready to transition um, into adulthood, you really need to think about what is it that is uh, um, the way that we want to live moving into the future. And it doesn't mean that it has to be um, tomorrow that somebody is going to move into a unit because, again, these are limited resources, so you're going to get on a waiting list um, for a multitude of these affordable housing um, options, and um, you know your plan could be um, in three years. We want to um, you know have the opportunity to move into uh, individual unit, or our plan is we want to um, find someone that um, we're interested in having a roommate, um, and we want to find the right roommate, and then um, make sure that we're going to uh, move into a property that will have two bedrooms so that we can share uh, a, a, an apartment. Many of us. I know my first apartments were always shared because of affordability, right? Um, so it's not um, an uncommon thing to do. And that's totally different than sharing a four bedroom home with eight people, right? You know, having a two bedroom apartment where I have a lease, both of us have a lease, we have rights of tenancy, um, you know, those kinds of things. The, uh, the challenge when you think about roommates that you need to keep in mind is that um, uh, if you put two people together um, income, 
that uh, Social Security disability, you'll stay underneath the 30% of area median income cap. You start to add in the third person, and you usually all go over area median income for a three-person household, okay? So, so you have to be careful about that when you're thinking about um, uh, roommate options. Many people um, uh, with intellectual or developmental disability are able to draw a higher amount of Social Security because of their, um, their pulling off of their parents or um, other folks. Um, so um, you have to kind of keep that in mind, you know, in the back of your mind as you're thinking about the potential for roommates, but um, there, there is definitely the potential um, um, for roommates. Um, I put up here, I kind of put together like a bullet point um, uh, that I didn't send out before about the supportive housing options um, or show SHO because we are showing how people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can live in the community. Um, uh, I put a, I ran off about a hundred because um, I wasn't sure how many were going to be here and I didn't send it prior so you can um, pick that up um, if you like. Um, I uh, could talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about this stuff um, for a long time but I don't I don't want to get into the weeds. I want to answer questions that um, people are interested in knowing about. Um, and um, I also, um, as um, they mentioned in my bio, um, do uh, help oversee the Employment First initiative at the state of Illinois. So um, I would uh, um, push back and say you definitely need to ask the DRS for everything that you need because we are working on um, making that possible within um, the WIOA and vocational rehab change that have come into effect. A person with, um, uh, with uh, high support needs um, should, is eligible to have a VR case, a voc rehab case opened at the age of 14. Um, and it is um, not a standard practice. And we are working towards um, how to um, uh, improve that system. So I know that um, it's, it's very easy um, to get overwhelmed and challenged by are um, complicated systems, but um, without parents and advocates who um, push for the change that we are trying to work towards, um, it will never happen. So um, please, you know, think about um, uh, ways that um, you can um, continue to assist in that process. If you um, come into any situation where you don't feel like you're getting um, the answers that you need, please always feel free to email me or um, give me a call and we will um, try to push from the inside. I do work in the secretary's office, so sometimes that helps um, with um, the other divisions and um, it is a, uh, you know, um, an opportunity to continue to grow the system. We have a, a federal grant from the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy um, for employment first related um, changes. We're working on culture change from the in inside because um, our internal culture has to change, our provider culture has to change, and the expectations of consumers and parents has to change so that we are able to um, move into a much more integrated um, uh, employment and housing um, opportunity. And I will just say that the Division of Developmental Disabilities has um, their um, adults with disabilities, Medicaid uh, with developmental disabilities, Medicaid waiver um, that is um, in uh, getting ready to be in the renewal process. And within that waiver, we have requested supported employment, individual support um, service definitions, uh, quite a bunch of them um, that um, will uh, change um, and add Add, uh, you know, lots of job coaching, discovery, job readiness, um, all that kind of stuff um, that they talk about underneath customized employment. We don't call it customized employment in the Division of Developmental Disability as much, but it's basically the same thing. It's supported employment um, with individual supports. So instead of a group setting um, at day training, I'm going to work on being in the community and we have those um, definitions uh, in the waiver and we'll hope for uh, approval and I don't I would assume that um, CMS will be happy to approve those as long as we have um, answered all their questions about how that's going to be implemented and how we're going to make sure that we incentivize those services by um, paying a good rate. Um, and uh, then we um, uh, will be able to begin rolling out um, those services as they're approved. Then, then providers will have to train their staff that are going to deliver those services. We have to work on building community capacity and then 
we will slowly um, have people hopefully select to, to receive those services in addition to or instead of day training um, options. So that's just a little smidge about what is going on, um, you know, in the uh, employment first kind of uh, realm that we're trying to um, work on also. So I'd be happy, I have no idea what time it is, but um, I'd be happy to, um, you know, try to answer any questions that you have and if there are you know, like specific situational things that we don't need to talk about in front of everybody. We can either talk about it afterwards or you can email me or give me a call. Can you raise your hand and I'll get the mic to you. Mm -hmm. uh, how does one access this? I mean, you mentioned that parents or individuals don't sell. Um, yep. So um, we recommend um, that um, you work with your individual service coordination entity um, to get on to our statewide referral network or 811 list. Can you explain what that is? They don't know what you're talking about on ISC. Oh, um, the individual service coordination um, entities or um, some people call them ISSAs or that's the, um, that's the uh, planning, that's where you get on the puns list, right? Um, oh, you guys are lucky. If it's CAU, they're the best, um, uh, they're the best ISC in the state. It's where you go to get on puns and where you go to do your planning um, around what kind of services you want. They're the people that will create a person-centered plan as we move forward with you and your um, uh, uh, child, so loved one. <laughs> oh yeah, prioritization of urgency of need for services is the non-waiting waiting list that we have um, for uh, Medicaid services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, on uh, through Medicaid that you're interested in housing options. Yeah. So if, for example, our son is 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would do it now um, because, um, because you know, depending upon where he's interested in living and um, what the community area is and all that, you know, I mean, it could take um, some time to actually be selected um, and, and matched to a unit that is where he wants. And if he is matched and doesn't have the services or it's not exactly where he wants to go or it's not quite time yet, you can always say no um, and just stay on the list and wait for the next time to get matched. So it's never too soon. Um, I also encourage people. Right, no, it, not at all. Um, it does not at all affect your place on the um, statewide referral network or 811 um, waiting list. Um, it, uh, it is um, uh, not at all, um, there's no punitive action if you say no So um, to a unit. And let me just say um, really quickly that um, we encourage people that haven't been selected yet from the waiting list for service um, to go ahead if you're gonna be interested in housing and get um, on the waiting list because um, you know, it just was released yesterday, they're gonna pull another 900 people in April and send out um, letters um, as well as we have to within the Ligus um, uh, consent decree um, work on um, uh, let's see, well, how does it say? Reason we have to have a reasonable pace for serving people off of our non-waiting list waiting list. I say that because you're not supposed to have a waiting list for Medicaid services, so that's why it's called the prioritization of urgency for need, of need for service, or PUNS list instead of a waiting list. Um, but um, the, um, there's gonna be people um, selected in April, there's gonna pe be people ongoing, what happens if you end up in a crisis situation and are eligible for services because you're in a crisis situation, but you're not on the waiting list. So, you know, again, if you get selected for a match with a unit and you don't have the service package that you need um, at the time that you are selected, you can say no and then there will be no punitive actions. But unless you get onto um, these waiting lists, um, you know, again, it's the affordable housing lottery, so you gotta play to win. I know we have a lot of questions, and we do have more time for questions, so I will get to you, I promise. Time's quick. I don't know if I should ask you later, but uh, you mentioned employment first. My son's aged out of the system. He had a broken veil at the IRS. Uh, they said, because competitive employment is what they're talking about, they said he's not work ready, and they turned him down for any employment services. Uh, when you suggest I kind of how long ago? reconsider? How, how long ago did that happen? Uh, about a month. <laughs> about a month? Um, 
so if you want to email me some specific information, if you'd be willing to share that, I'll see what I can um, do in terms of um, uh, checking out the possibility of... of I know it was uh, through a vocational employment, and they just, I guess they don't consider him uh, work ready in terms of competitive employment. Yeah. Uh, so, that's so... All, that's yeah. the only... Yeah. Were considering. yeah. So send um, send me some basic information. I'll see what I can do okay. to help us. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Is there one in the back? Yes. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Oh. Can you hold on a second? I'm not okay. With this home based service, per week, how how do you get that? The home based service, yeah. you have to you have to be offered um, services off of the puns list. Also, you have to be selected from the puns list. So um, the uh, home based services is just um, uh, a different program than the 24 hour SILA um, that's um, available underneath our Medicaid waiver, waiver and statutorily. So if you're um, uh, got a transition age um, child, um, that it has to be transition age. no, no. But I'm just saying, if you have um, anybody that has not been selected for service, who is not receiving state Medicaid-funded um, intellectual and developmental disability services, needs to be on the PUNS list that they access through the ISC so that they can be selected for service. And they can either you can say that you want either home-based service or 24-hour SILA, or you want to be considered for both. Okay, what kind of services would you get? So if you look at, um, you can look up um, home, that's, um, you can look up home, but if you go to the DHS website and look up home, but you can see what the specific listings are, um, but it's basically a more flexible program because um, it doesn't have a housing component to it, a residential component to it, so it's based in usually the home where the um, uh, recipient is residing, which oftentimes is a parental home, right? And you are able to um, select um, uh, types of services that you want to do. You can either hire your own um, uh, uh, direct support staff that would be able to deliver that service, um, or you can work with an agency um, uh, through them to hire a staff that would deliver those services. There are people that have done supported employment services, job coaching, and um, that kind of thing through it. You can do personal care things. You can do you know a variety a variety of things, but you have a capped amount of money, um, uh, so you. Um, people like the flexibility because you can hire who you want and you can pay more than what a direct support um, person gets in the other programs. Um, but then you only have um, uh, two um, times the federal Social Security wage um, to spend. Um, so, you know, you have a capped amount of money. And so you can purchase that, um, those services um, spread over, you know, the 52 weeks of the year, um, you know, divided into how much the money is, if that makes sense. So that's, that's, that's separate from what? Social Security. Social Security. Yes, mm -hmm. that's Medi it's Medicaid money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can I just say, if you're unfamiliar, if the term puns means nothing to you, we need to talk. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, so, absolutely. I'm not being funny. Um, we, I want you to, to understand that you're not going to get any services in the state of Illinois if you are not on the puns waiting list. Not going to happen, right? Right. So let's talk after. Um, depending on where you live, you either go into Community Alternative Limited, if that's to your local VISA or wherever you live, but you have to get on the puns list. And I encourage you, even if you're saying today, oh, I don't need anything, get on the puns list. Um, the poll that Lori's talking about of 900 people in the month of April, I just read it. It's really quite interesting this time that they're pulling. It's sort of, you never really know why you're pulled or what the criteria is because it changes from poll to poll. But this particular poll is based on who's been on the list the longest in the highest level of need categories. So if you don't get out of today, you're at the bottom of the list and you're going to you know, potentially wait longer. You need to get on pump. So come up and talk to us after. We'll help you. Um, like Lori said, there's SILA funding through PUNS. There's home-based waiver funding through PUNS, and there's also home services, which is different than home-based. So right. um, everything's got a little bit different thing, but let's talk after, because I hate, you know, I know a lot of people are already on PUNS and you've heard it and done it. So let's talk after, okay? 
I was just going to ask, I have students who have cut cases and then students who we refer to DRS. So for my students that we refer to DRS, if their families wanted to access the Illinois housing, they have to open punch cases no matter what? So supportive housing is affordable housing plus the services and supports you need. And it's usually not employment services that are going to support you in your housing, right? So if, um, if, uh, if a person truly needs um, supportive housing, so that support is the part, right? And, and so, um, and, and the key too is just because I have a DRS um, uh, open um, case doesn't mean that um, I don't, I might not need services after um, the time frame that I can have a DRS open case. I might need um, ongoing job coaching, which they can't pay for, um, you know, past a certain amount of time, you know, at DRS. So um, I would always, I would make sure that, that they, even if they have um, and are referred um, to DRS and have open cases, um, that um, you also put them on the pencils if they're going to need, if they need service, you know, I mean, if they're going to need that ongoing support, if they don't need that, then they probably don't need um, supportive housing. Um, they might need affordable housing, um, which you could still go to, like, the public housing authorities, um, waiting lists and those other pieces. But, um, you know, supportive housing is kind of a niche kind of housing um, for folks that are going to need ongoing support in order to um, be supported in the community within their own um, individual unit. Mm -hmm. And just for families out here that are wondering about puns, usually the school district in which your student attends on parent night or your school district will find a night where a puns person can come out and talk to families so you know more about it. So if you still have a student in school, even if they're in the transition program, 18 to 22 years old, um, talk to the transition program or your high school to see about how to have Puns reps come out and talk to your school districts for your families. It just brought to my attention that there's a puns night on April 10th. They're <laughs> sold out. Well, they're sold out. Oh, no. You need to schedule no. on But we try to put it on the Connected Community website. Whenever we hear about a puns registration night, we try to put it on our website. Just go to the events page from time to time and see. Because um, they are, they do them all the time. I mean, they're we'll all scaling up. At, we'll have another one in the fall. Um, but in the meantime, even if you go, if you call community alternatives and tell them where you live, that school districts will schedule all throughout the year. And so um, call community alternatives and tell them where you live, and they may say when the puns night, when, you know, the nearest puns night is. I think Schaumburg had one a few weeks yeah. ago. And um, NSSEV had one last month, so they're all year round. So just make sure that you call them and tell them where you live. And I didn't mention that because we're sold out. For <laughs> but since everyone's here, you can get us in, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Did we get your Hamilton tickets? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. um, I see a question in the back, and then I'll back to you. I think there might be a conflict of interest if you give her Hamilton tickets. <laughs> I have a question about how you, so my son gets, is on, gets home-based services. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. He, I think he's had them for four years. Okay. At some point, we're going to need supportive housing for him. Mm -hmm. How do you go from home-based services to a higher a higher level of support. Mm -hmm. Technically, you. So, um, you're supposed to be able to. Um, all of us change, right? Um, and so you're supposed to be able to respond to those changes, but it's much easier to go down from a 24-hour cell service to home-based service than it is to go up. Um, so um, technically at this point, I believe the division tells people um, that if they have home base and they are interested in 24-hour, quote unquote, then they should be on the puns list for 24 hours. But, um, uh, you know, um, if you work with um, CA, you. Um, I have found that they are very good at if there is a affordable housing option available to a person in writing the documentation to request um, an increase in hours um, or a change to what we would call intermittent SILA kind of special, the show the base hours based on what the individual person needs, um, based on um, having access to a housing resource, um, aging parents, um, uh, you know, uh, change in, I'm, 
I didn't mean anything by that. I'm aging too. <laughs> I see everybody with, they're whispering back there. See, she's saying we're old. No, I'm just saying that that is part of, um, that is part of, <laughs> that is part of the concern, right? When you have home base is that, you know, you're, I'm not going to be here forever, you know? So what's going to happen? So, um, so, you know, um, you know, there, if you work with CAU, they're really, they're really good at um, writing things and we work with them really closely a lot um, in terms of trying to do things and advocate for hours. So, you know, if you um, think that, you know, that's going to be something that's of interest in the next couple years, I'd get on the list. And then, you know, then as you, as you get selected and matched to a unit, you have some more um, powerful leverage to use with the um, division when you request things because you have access um, to a resource and then it doesn't become a crisis case for them whenever God forbid something does happen and then your your child then ends up um, in a place that you've worked your whole life not to have them be in um, because of the crisis so you know let's let's serve people before um, there's a crisis and then it costs less and it's better for the person in what they choose um, I can't hear, so um, can you give her that back to me on the list? I'm sorry. I don't hear well. I'm sorry. We do have services through CAU. Mm -hmm. We have a mm -hmm. person from CAU who comes yep. four times a year or whatever. So would that be the... Yep. Tell them you want to get on the um, SRN Thank waiting you list. Uh, it's a similar question. Uh, for the people who's getting the uh, home basic and also at this option for doing the house, using the housing, is that reversible or once you go to one program, is it the end? Um, so, is a, so let me see if I can clarify the question. So is the question, if you move into housing and it's not, you don't feel it's successful, um, does that harm you in any way? Are you going to lose services on the service side? Is that kind of the question? So if I like, try to go to the housing and sell us, and then, the, then of course the home basic funding will be gone. So, so once the, the seller is not working well, go back to the home, will that uh, home basic you can always you can always reduce the number of uh, the the services that you're getting. Um, so um, let's say um, you let's say so let, let me give you two scenarios. One is home based services are enough um, for your um, uh, loved one to be able to live in their own unit. Um, if that's the case, which it has been for people that have access um, our units, um, not all of them, but some of them, you just don't even need to change services, right? You just use the home-based services that you have in a different environment, not your home, in your loved one's home, own home, when they access a unit, um, affordable unit. Two, if you do need additional hours in order to access that unit um, and you get moved up to intermittent SILA from home base, you can always reduce hours down. They'll, they'll let you all day long go from 24-hour intermittent SILA down to home base because that's less hours and less expensive. Um, it's the moving up that's the harder thing to do, um, although still possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, basically, yes. It is basically reversible. I think she was asking that if you got all through all those hoops and you get into a 24 hour or intermittent SOA and it doesn't work out, can you automatically reinstitute? your home-based funding. Yeah, so what I'm saying is you can always go down um, to, you You know, if you have a high, if you have a higher level of service, either 24-hour or intermittent SILA services and um, the, the, the housing unit, you feel like it didn't work out, something's not, you feel like it's not good, you can always ask the Division of Developmental Disabilities through your ISC agency to go back to home-based services, and hopefully CAU people, I am um, uh, telling the truth. Um, they are all, they are, they, I'm saying the division is usually pleased to spend less money um, than uh, more money, so they're much more apt. Um, now, I can't tell you how quickly the process happens, right? Um, but um, it, it has happened, it does happen, um, whenever people um, seek to, like maybe they've moved out, you feel like it didn't work out, you're going to move back home, you just need home-based services, um, then you can um, request that um, to happen. I just wanted to comment, I might be the only one here in DuPage County, but if anyone in DuPage County, the PASS agency is day one packed. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs>
And they have not, and they have not been as active um, with our waiting list. And I'm very happy to um, uh, uh, have any of you encourage them to give me a call. Anybody on this side before I head to that side? You guys are making work. No? There, did you? Okay. Are you sure. Uh, um, I have a question. My, uh, I have two um, sons with disabilities, 16 and 18 and my 18 year old is going to be 19 and he's on the CAU and I understand all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I also took on my brother's problems. Um, he's 55 years old. Okay. And uh, my um, CAU person had said, oh, she gave me another CAU person and she had asked me, well, go ahead and talk to them. And I'm trying to get my brother funding, um, but I'm, I need to find um, proof that he's, you know. Right, has a right disability, uh-huh, right. Right. He's 55, he went to minor school. I went to two, District 214. There's no records. How do I? I'm guessing I'm getting right now. That's not Yeah. Where could I start? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, my kid is years old. He lives with her, and so I'm yeah. in the process of. Yeah. Right, trying to know, trying plan to for, for in, right. You know, right. In the near future. And right. And, uh, that's been my dead end. So, somebody from. Yeah. I, mean, I, I would just think, Chris, that you could have them evaluated yeah. we and did then, for social security because okay. i just got him medicaid right got him social security i got him all that stuff but it was he's intellectual disability but they keep telling me from ciu you, we need stuff from way back when he's got a, a letter from access back in 1982 or something that's not good I don't know. Well, I still get. You know, well, like, the district and the district doesn't have that. Obviously, uh -huh. the district has nothing. Like I went to. We went to Rolling Meadows. We I went there. Then I went to two thirteen, and they said, I am just like I don't know where else to go. <laughs> I've heard sometimes in these cases, kind of young might be able to help. I don't know for sure, but the family I know went through them and they were at least able to refer them to some resources to help them when they didn't have documentation. Right. You might want to reach out to them. I don't know. We tried doctors who are no longer living. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm really confused by the history needed because um, we're familiar that Social Security and Medicaid are horrible. They're pretty hard. Yeah, if you got that, that's about, <laughs> about the. Is is it the before twenty two thing? You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, because I might be able to prove I'm disabled now, but was I dis? Do I meet the? You know, because to be a person with intellectual or developmental disability, I have to be um, diagnosed before I turn twenty two, right? 